Well, thank you uh, for joining us today, um, this morning. I know it's a busy time of year, and um, and so it's it's, it's it's sometimes hard to take time out of our schedules to to uh, to participate in some of the most exciting research. But that's what we've got here. Um, so I'm glad that you could join us, and those of you who are able to watch it um, afterwards, um, I think you'll also find it uh, fascinating. Because today we have Oksana Ismail Biakova who is speaking to us on uh, the topic Daughters as Orjiza, Marriage, Security, and Care Strategies for Daughters Among Uzbeks in Southern Kyrgyzstan. Oksana uh, finished her doctoral thesis at the Max Planck Institute for Social Anthropology in Germany, uh, in Halle, Germany, and she's been one of the leading ethnographic lights for the study of particularly Kyrgyzstan, but Central Asia more generally, where she's focused on issues of of kinship, governance, uh, political patronage, uh, gender, um, uh, among other other kinds of topics. Um, the her first book was published by Indiana University Press, and it's just it's just terrifically nuanced. Where sometimes the discussions end up being non nuanced. Um, it's terrifically well grounded. Where uh, sometimes that's uh, not the case, and it's a study really of kinship uh, and its entanglements in. Um, in uh, Northern Kyrgyzstan. Um, and it's, I, I really, really commend it to your attention. Indiana University Press, Blood Ties and the Native Sun, um, 2017. So she is a postdoctoral researcher at the, and I practiced this because Aksana <laughs> told me how to pronounce it, at the Centrum Moderna Orient or something like that, um, which is uh, in Berlin. And, and she's turned her attention to the study of local Uzbek communities in Osh, Kyrgyzstan, as well as in Yekaterinburg, uh, Russia, though I imagine that field access to, to Russia probably is a little bit more challenging. Um, and she always has interesting things to say, which is why we wanted to make sure that we um, had a chance to hear from her on this exciting research project. And Oksana, I think you'll go for about 30 minutes or so, and then we will um, open it up to, to questions and, and discussion. And, and see how it shakes out. We have an hour and a half scheduled. Um, sometimes we end up using a little bit less than that and, and, uh, and we'll see how it goes. But we're so delighted to welcome you virtually to Toronto. Thank you, Edward. Thank you so much for your kind invitation. And I would like to immediately start showing my presentation. So I hope, do you see it right? Good. Uh, the, the title of my talk is Daughters as Ojiza, Daughters Marriage, Security, Care among Uzbeks in Southern Kyrgyzstan. And I would like to share some of the findings that I have been observing on the importance of caring daughters uh, for several years. And I will explain why I decided to write a paper on this uh, topic. If you can see at this mosque, uh, I have been doing research on um, Uzbeks, especially after Osh events, inter, between uh, intercommunal conflict between Kyrgyz and Uzbeks. And I was interested in looking at how uh, local people, those who were affected by conflict, were coping with this post, uh, conflict situation. And I went to do research um, in 2013 looking at the coping strategies of people, how they are dealing with this post-conflict context. And I also went to in 2015 in order to investigate how Uzbek as an ethnic minority are um, uh, protecting their business in corrupt government and how what are their negotiation between this patronage network, intra-ethnic relationships. So I, and then I also went in 2018 uh, to do research uh, among Uzbeks looking as being part of the big project on kinship in Central Asia. And so throughout this, uh, uh, these years, um, apparently when I was reading all, all, all my field notes, Apparently, this taking daughters were always there in my field notes. Of course, that time I didn't really pay attention, mainly because my focus was on looking on business, on bigger, on migration, or on corruption, or other big things. And then somehow, when I kept reading in, in those um, field notes, there was constant this care, concern for the care of daughters and. 
And, uh, and then I started to realize how this uh, taking care of daughter is so fundamental for Uzbek uh, communities. And I started to go in depth in order to understand the meaning behind why they uh, spend a lot of attention on taking care of their daughters, even though they live in a super patriarchal society, as we know. And, uh, and in 2013, for example, I remember that people would constantly tell me that during Osh events, we would keep our daughters in the mosque as a way to protect their dignity. And this was in several mahalas that I conducted my research. And uh, as I said, I didn't really pay attention to the importance of this aspect. Uh, I thought just taking care of other family members. But apparently later, I, I understood that it has a broader significance that I would like to share with you. And... Um, and this paper will be part of the uh, edited volume that will come out in 2013 as part of a, a book on the uh, Rutledge Handbooks, uh, Central Asian Worlds. And uh, I can also share you some of my preliminary <clears throat> writings with you. And this, uh, what I would like to now discuss is uh, kind of provide you a big, uh, brief introduction about the sociopolitical background. I would engage with the debates in anthropology of altruism and kinship cooperation. Uh, I will also introduce you with the, um, the Uzbek marriage system and local meanings of Uzbek marriage patterns in connection with caring relationships between daughters and parents in times of conflict. And uh, so basically this paper, uh, this presentation is about gender in Central Asia and uh, more specifically looking at the gendered aspect of a uh, uh, relationship in patriarch enduring patriarchal society. So as I said, I did uh, my uh, research mostly in Osh and Jalalabad in southern part of Kyrgyzstan, which is uh, Uzbeks are uh, largest minority in Kyrgyzstan, consist like 14% uh, approximately. And they and the, and the Uzbeks usually reside mostly in Osh and Jalalabad oblast of, um, of this of Fergana Valley. And as we know that Fergana Valley is quite interesting place where there's constant exchange of networks, cross-border marriages, lots of um, other social and economic interactions happens like uh, trade. And uh, as we know, when uh, we if we look at the existing literature on uh, Soviet or regional or Western literature on Soviet Central Asian societies, we uh, read a lot on the, uh, the emphasis, a lot of this literature on the patrilineality, on patriarchy. And in most of the context, sometimes we also see kind of women are oppressed, inferior or suppressed position. And a lot of text it's possible to find on ancestors, seven fathers or grandfathers, descendants, genealogies, sons, so on. What is understudied so far is the significance of matrif local care or other type of kin relationship that exist, but somehow they are not verbalized, which is uh, interesting to observe because uh, because there are a lot of other kind of support kin ne uh, support network exists but they are not necessarily talked, discussed. Even if you do in-depth interview, women would just keep focusing more on broader patrilineality or patriarchy, or even keep talking a lot about the husband side, uh, instead of really focusing on the practical side of kin network that really, that the woman gets support. And, and I started to wonder why that a lot of, even in our interviews, even ethnographists do not help us in, in understanding all these uh, this, uh, muted forms of uh, conversation. And, uh, and, uh, and usually these uh, woman voices are muted and cannot be even heard by women themselves. And it's related to the fact that the women articulate themselves or can recreate all the narratives in the dominant idioms of uh, kinship or patrilineality or genealogy. And, but the practic practical kin or other social networks are not verbalized, not talked, especially if you um, want to focus on, uh, for example, if you want to learn more about the mother side, which is not even discussed 
uh, in details. And I have uh, conducted uh, this uh, re research uh, with women uh, by really focusing on other types of practical relations, looking at the, uh, uh, we have um, this computer assisted interviewing software method of gathering kin networks. So, uh, and uh, this kinship network questionnaire is really good because this allows um, ago one this uh, lady and we would uh, ask her to tell us put in the diagram all her relatives that she remembers and approximately among Uzbeks what we see is uh, they can tell us like medium 200 from 200 to 300 uh, relatives uh, by heart, uh, including their birthdays, when they got married, when they got divorced. And, um, and if you see, I hope it's visible, this kind of, this kind of diagram would uh, appear, but uh, Edward, you know that among uh, Kazakh and Kyrgyz, these uh, genealogies are quite vertical. So the Kazakh and Kyrgyz keep remembering <clears throat> up to seven generations. However, Uzbeks, um, this, uh, um, they could remember, for example, their uh, maximum grandparents. And, and then this uh, genealogical depth would collapse, but rather the genealogical knowledge was really uh, um, horizontal. So it's, and they could remember amazingly up to 200 uh, their cousin names. And, and it's also linked to the idea of uh, this marriage pattern that the Uzbeks prefer cousin marriages. And then this um, memory or genealogical memory is also quite tied to this uh, uh, logic of uh, marriage logic on uh, cousin marriages. <clears throat> and uh, if, you, if we look closer, then we have collected this amount of this kind of information. And with this program, it's possible to uh, collect, uh, put, it's like survey, but you can later um, transfer your findings into <clears throat> SPSS and analyze it. And uh, my question was really simple, like, why do parents help their children? So I really focused and try, uh, try to look uh, why Uzbek help their children and uh, whether they're biased towards their sons or daughters. And, and thanks to this program, it was possible to, <clears throat> to learn more about the, uh, the practical aspect of kinship uh, rather than <clears throat> ideological. And um, as I said, this is a kind of combination of qualitative and quantitative that methods of collecting data. And I have been in uh, OSH uh, several <clears throat> years. Uh, and uh, I also include ethnography, individual voices, biographies, di desires. And I conducted like 40 individual interviews, uh, one interview like for eight hours, because uh, all, when you keep collecting genealogists, you just have these 200 people to include into the system. It takes time. And then you just have to click each um, relative in order to learn more about the especially degree of support that they provide to each other. So that's why one interview took me like eight to 10 hours. And, yeah, and as I said, this uh, presentation is about gender in Central Asia. And usually uh, in the literature, uh, woman has, women in Central Asia have been described in terms of being neither colonized uh, nor modern, for example, Denis Candioti. And uh, what th does this mean? This means the Central Asian women maintain kind of traditional kinship structure. They are also uh, involved in arranging marriages. They also um, control uh, gendered resources. They also actively involve local economies. At the same time, they're also quite um, cultural or social drivers of uh, change and adaptation. And uh, at the same time, what we see, uh, the Central Asian were also involved in a wider economy. They were involved in labor due to the Soviet legacy. And with the collapse of the Soviet Union, what we see in the in Central Asian, 
countries kind of a revival of Islam on the one hand, conservatism, anti-liberalism, traditionalism, and due to this promotion of nationalism. And we also see kind of Western donors that coming in uh, the, the projects on, on the different gender equality, individual private property. So these women are caught in between of uh, Soviet heritage, heritage, strong nationalism between conservative Islam and Western ideas. So, and I, with this presentation, I really want to focus more on women's individual agencies because they really navigate between different uh, spheres and they're quite uh, uh, creative and uh, flexible, adapting to different uh, influences at the same time, uh, reversing some of them, uh, manipulating them. So I would like to highlight this pattern. And I would also encourage others that um, Central Asia is really ideal place to study gender. And we have to do it a lot, mainly because of this uh, uh, Soviet, post-Soviet experiences that women have, uh, which would really contribute to, for example, any feminist uh, discussion in, in social science. In my case, for example, in anthropology. And the Central Asia is also quite a good place or good laboratory for investigations, all kinds of contradictions because of this diverse modes of social organizations. When we look at Kazakh and Kyrgyz, they used to be mobile herders or pastoral nomads, mainly engaged in livestock and breeding. Whereas with Uzbek and Tajiks, they were sedentary farmers and ur urbanities and their main occupation were craftsmen and traders. And if we look uh, closer then what we see here is Central Asian kinship is kind of a uh, source of cultural diversity. And because they have different modes of social organization. For example, if we look at the, if we look at the, the marriage, their preference, usually among Kyrgyz and Kazakh, they prefer long distance marriages. However, Uzbek and Tajiks prefer short distance or they, we see a lot uh, predominance among Kyrgyz Kazakh bride price. However, among Uzbek and Tajiks dowry, we see the importance of seven generations in the case of um, Kazakh and Kyrgyz. However, among Uzbek and Tajiks, we see cousin marriages. And so here I would like to focus on this specific um, aspect on uh, uh, on uh, how these uh, uh, parents care about uh, care their daughters. And uh, I looked at the age and generation as important unit and looking at the intergenerational relations through the lens of care. My study, for example, daughters and uh, mothers kind of uh, present specific forms of and, um, complexities. So I look at the, not only one, one dimensional way of care, but really intergenerational care. And here uh, the marriage becomes also quite important institution that I will also closely look at it. And as I said, my research question is very simple. Why do parents help their children, especially daughters in enduring patriarchy? Because they should have upon the marriage move to the husband's family and then that's all but no no it's not apparently the case because Uzbeks keep providing support to their mm. daughters and um, in anthropology of altruism and human cooperation there are different arguments concerning the role of kinship what motivates people to help each other especially their children and all perspectives on kinship agree that humans are willing to cooperate and support each other but they disagree on the nature of incentives. And I would like to test to what extent uh, this kind of discuss discussions would perfectly or would fit or not fit into the case of Uzbeks in Kyrgyzstan. And uh, there are in anthropology, <coughs> different perspective. One is functionalist perspective, which is, which is about this. Um, the, the main aim, main claim is that the amity functions within kinship networks and those who are strangers fall outside of the realm of altruism. So meaning that those who don't belong to the kin network 
they there is they will not get support from the uh, from people or economic perspective it's a, it's a matter of strategy rather than altruism that humans are rational self-interested humans that even even if they are generous so meaning that those bigs help their their children while at the same time they are thinking about the, their own future well-being or welfare so the, the logic of this economic perspective lies here or instrumental aspect of kinship in which kinship is not detached from the property or inheritance. So that's why they support each other because they think about this inheritance or the cultural one. It's about the local understanding, discourses, practice of relatedness. Altruism among kin is motivated by culturally learned moral values and symbolic constructs among Uzbeks. This would be a kind of ojiza or treating daughters as vulnerable. And this would belong to this category of a symbolic construct. I also engage in the, in the paper, uh, the anthropological study of care, uh, looking very closely at the gender and generation, mainly because as I said, on the one hand, we see kind of uh, care of Uzbeks towards their uh, daughters, especially in, uh, in uh, enduring patriarchy. So on the one hand, we have this strong patriarchal society. On the other hand, there is a kind of a space for women to use this space for their own benefits. And it's given and it's uh, called under different uh, terminology. But in, the, in this case, um, I use the term uh, ojiza which I will explain more in details, but it's, it's about the space that women can, can, be, can use uh, so that they are taken care of well. And um, so most of what we see kind of um, balance between uh, support for women on the one hand, on the other hand, hand kind of a strong patriarchy and, and balance of patriarchy and um, support woman, woman for women, especially this the agency uh, is quite interesting to uh, explore. And so we have this, uh, and as a result, what we see here, a kind of intense economic and effective investment in daughters after marriage is common, even in the context of enduring patriarchy. And so I wanted to highlight this aspect that care relations are expected to still follow the, all these patriarchal principles, with a concern for a daughter centered uh, on her marriageability, while long-term concerns for security are afforded to sons. So it's a really balanced system. And um, more specifically, uh, what we can see is kind of uh, daughter security is on the first place. Uh, we see the, how the parents care uh, for their daughters uh, using the uh, local idea, treating daughters as Ojiza. Ojiza is vulnerable and ideal for providing for daughter security in marriage. So how they do that, they provide kind of knowledge. They collect lots of knowledge of potential future marriage partners. They invest in the relationship on maternal side or preferred marriages at a short distance. So in case if there is need for women or for daughters, uh, some support so that parents would be available. And I would like to, uh, those who are not aware of the uh, Central Asian context, uh, highlight the ideal type of Uzbek marriage in which um, uh, ideal is a marriage should be at a short distance. And the uh, Uzbek informants trace descent from mother and father sides equally, unlike Kyrgyz and uh, uh, Kazakh. Uh, and cousin, cousin marriage is, is ideal marriage, especially parallel and uh, cross cousin marriages. Genealogies collapse, and uh, knowledge of uh, cousin as a because of this marriage strategy is impressive, as I have shown. But of course, uh, this were ideal type of marriage. But uh, what we see, the violation still happens, uh, for example, this because of migration or cousin marriages usually end up with divorce. At the same time, we also see a lot of pattern in which uh, ideal uh, marriage patterns still can be realized. Or there is kind of statement that divorced parents' children would not have successful marriages. But we also see that there are lots of successful marriages that of uh, divorced parents. 
So another thing about daughter security is uh, uh, the unverbalized or non-verbalized support that women get from mother's side. Even though if you interview them, they would not tell, but nevertheless, um, if you observe, you will see that women get a lot of support from mother's side, especially mother's brother, which is called Toga. And, uh, and then the young woman, uh, for young women, they, um, the system uh, gives them this opportunity to, to uh, seek out, expand, deepen relations with their own family and relatives. And uh, dowry is involved. So that in case a woman is not uh, cannot uh, um, work immediately, so that this is kind of a pre mortem inheritance, and kind of there is also a special relationship between father in law and son in law. Now I would like to discuss more in details about the daughters as Ojiza. This is something that I was really surprised, mainly because. Um, during my interview, in all these years, people would constantly claim that their daughters are vulnerable, ojiza. And ojiza means, in Uzbek language, blind, weak, powerless, helpless, uh, incapable of doing something. So also it has social meaning that she would be constantly dependent uh, on parents or husbands. And the, thus, the daughters beg for support, constant support, unable to do anything. And they constantly suffer from emotional and financial support, which is kind of local ideas that have people. And I was surprised that these daughters were not vulnerable at all. They were so strong. But despite them being very strong and um, even financially independent, nevertheless, this, because of this idea, local ideas, that exist that people uh, this uh, the relatives keep helping their daughters uh, mother's uh, brother help uh, um, relatives from mother's side support constant help to the daughters uh, whenever there is a need for her even without the need she would still really enjoy this um, uh, this uh, idea uh, of ojiza being unable to do anything How, however we know that it's not true, but nevertheless, this kind of idea is still so strong that was um, uh, in all my interviews, that was really apparent. And how now I would like to come back to this uh, local marriage strategies, especially how this uh, um, Uzbek marriage custom changed during and after OSH events, because uh, for Uzbek, it's important to provide the daughters with dowry upon the marriage. But after OSH events, uh, many parents couldn't provide dowry and then this ideal cousin marriage that Uzbek preferred that has been stretched to wider ethnic groups so uh, before the conflict if there was a possibility for Uzbek to bury Kyrgyz then in the post uh, event uh, it became that even uh, a girl is at a close distance they didn't want their daughters to get married to Kyrgyz, so they broadened this uh, cousin marriage preference and stretched it to ethnic group. And this has also played a crucial role as uh, ethnic boundary making between Kyrgyz and Uzbek. And, uh, and another thing, uh, as I said, uh, Uzbek also preferred a kind of short, short distance marriage, but after Osh events, they opted for marriage at a long distance. So as a kind of security strategy. And this is one of the uh, diagram that we could uh, withdraw from the, from the data that this computer assisted software that we used in collecting data. And I was interested um, in, uh, in uh, showing the degree of um, short distance because uh, short distance among, uh, among Uzbeks were like within 30 kilometers. So 40% uh, of marriages, for example, were uh, 30 kilometers, within 30 kilometers of radius. Uh, others were in a closer uh, distance. And, uh, and kin groups are really densely uh, populated and really kin and space really matters among Uzbeks. But because of this migration, uh, things have changed and changing. 
And now I would like to come back to this uh, theory that I have discussed about the, the cooperation of maternal kin in the support of uh, daughters in the patriarchal society. As I said, with, uh, in, in the context of um, Uzbeks in Kyrgyzstan, what we see that all theoretical arguments would perfectly fit into the context. On the one hand, we see that functionalist arguments would fit nicely mainly because uh, Uzbek also provide the support to their own daughters uh, and, uh, and they also provide according to their to her needs at the same time they also by giving their daughters not far away they are also securing parents their own material resources especially if they give within their cousin marriage uh, pool and and then there is also cultural argument as i said it's uh, culturally learned values to help relatives and in the context of uh, uzbek we see among daughters that the uh, treating daughters as vulnerable or ajiza this is a really uh, culturally learned value to help daughter uh, by claiming that they are really vulnerable and now i would like to go back to this uh, most that i have shown that the importance of uh, daughters, as you have seen, that, and now we can hopefully better understand why these Uzbeks kept their daughters in the mosque, because this was one of the ways to protect the dignity uh, of their families, but also the Uzbek communities, because this part of their um, uh, communal values. And however, the marriage strategies among Uzbeks are quite different. For example, in peaceful times, marriage practices are shared more by economic rationale, like meaning ojiza, securing material resources for daughters. In the during or post-conflict context, meaning of ojiza uh, was like girls' physical and sexual vulnerability in hostile environment kind of existential security of an ethnic honor through its uh, woman's virtue by drawing these ethnic boundaries. And so I will stop here and then I hope it was like 30 minutes, yeah? Oh, fantastic. Right, right on time and a rich, uh, rich presentation and it gives us a good place to, uh, to start. I mean, one of the things that's always characterized your work is both a thoroughness but also an open an openness to um ambiguity so I, I definitely want to talk a little bit about some of the um uh ambiguous moments because of course that's what you'll find if you get your fingernails dirty as you do when you go and do mm. research right uh, not everyone does um let me just say to the audience that if you have questions feel free to put them in the q a there should be a button at the bottom of your screen and we'll get to as many questions um as we as we can, um, so so that's a it's a terrific uh, topic. Of course, I mean one of the it's not a surprise to you, but the audience may may or may not know um, that I'm not a uh, an anthropologist, a social or cultural anthropologist. So I may be asking questions that are somewhat um, obvious or naive, or maybe an outsider perspective is actually um, sometimes uh, helpful to to help think about things. I guess I wanted to hear a little bit more about the different types of support. I mean, you started to get at it. Um, you said if economic and, eff and effective investment um, in daughters and their and care for daughters. Um, can you say a little bit more about what the types of um, support are under what circumstances the support would be provided to, to daughters uh, who would be providing them, right? Whether it's, this is, is, is your story in, uh, simply, um, uh, is it simply, are we simply looking at care provided by women for other women? Um, or are we talking about also men sometimes providing care in a way that would be similar to what women are providing for their, uh, for their, for their daughter? So mother to daughter, or can you imagine father to daughter? And, and what's what's some of the variation that you see? And um, yeah, I just I guess I want to learn a little bit more about some of the sort of aspects of care that um, and support that, that you that you see. And then I have a whole bunch of other questions, and hopefully people will add their own as well in the Q and A. Mm -hmm, thank you. Uh, concerning the different types of support, there are 
different kind of support depending on the needs. Uh, for example, if a girl gets married to a wealthy family, then probably she would not need a lot of support, economic support, rather more emotional support. So in case of illness, she would be constantly uh, invited to, to her natal family to visit uh, or uh, she, will, she will be provided like by taking care of her children uh, when she wants to have some rest so on. So, but if, of course, if a girl gets married to an economically uh, unstable family, then of course there would be a lot of support, economic support. And uh, this leads me to the second question concerning the uh, whether a woman would provide the support woman. Interestingly, the role of um, uh, younger brother or elder brother is crucial. Or um, toga or mother's brother. So the heart is mother's brother or daughter's um, uh, older brother or uh, uh, siblings. So it should be definitely uh, male from uh, female side or from maternal side. So this is also important. Uh, and another thing that I learned recently because I gave this presentation in Osh among Uzbeks. So I got really great feedback uh, among um, my informants uh, based on, on this presentation. And they told me that the Ojiza concept would not work well if there is no son in the family. So it might happen that one family might have like five daughters and there is no boy uh, in this family. So in this context, people will, would start really you know, worrying about that, oh, you would not be Ojiza anymore. So there will not be someone who would who would uh, think you you are as you are vulnerable. So that there is no man in the family or a brother who would keep um, carrying you even parents uh, pass away. And this kind of institution is really exist only when there is kind of um, uh, male within the family. So it's a balancing a kind of factor that has to be, to be vulnerable, there should be a man in the family of the girl. And without this, this Ojiza category would be under uh, questioned. And this I found really interesting that the, apparently it's really about balancing within patriarchal system that all this happens only there is a son. So, so idea of this elder brother or mother's brother is crucial in this notion. That's really actually quite interesting. I mean, it's sort of, um, it suggests, so you, so in the example you gave, somebody has, uh, five, there are five daughters in the family and the only siblings are daughters and there's no, there are no sons. Um, it suggests that the idea of vulnerability is really quite contextual here. It's not yes. necessarily, it's not sort of generalized across society because you could imagine some kind of culturally accepted trope where the idea is that young women are inherently by their nature always vulnerable and mm -hmm. in which case you would see this idea uh, playing itself out in families even that only had daughters right daughters by definition are vulnerable therefore they need some kind of action. but what you're saying mm -hmm. is that it's it's truly a function of the the type of family Right. Um, yeah. Rather than a sort of social, a broadly sort of socially generalized phenomenon. Does that make sense? Um, but there is still idea exists even in individual families. This might not fit into this category, but this idea you can in every interview you would still came across with this kind of idea. And however, in in some families, because of lack of uh, sons, this might this or a concept would not function quite well yeah right right I mean it seems like it would be hard to have a well I don't know um I again I'm not an expert on, on gender gender relations uh, in this context or or, or more or more broadly but it strikes me that you can't have patriarchy without paternalism and mm -hmm. and paternalism would imply some kind of notion of 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 providing care on behalf of which can mm -hmm. which you know I mean, depending on how you spin it, can sound either quite generous and and quite welcome, or quite paternalistic on on the part of those who are um, interested and have every reason to um, reproduce the existing, you know, existing gender relations. 
So I wonder how does it does this play into ideas of paternalism that you see across um, the uh, across uh, Uzbeks in southern Kyrgyzstan? Definitely, there is paternalism, a care around it, and and uh, especially this uh, uh, because there is constant uh, this uh, when there is a son in the family, this means that the son would stay with the family, would take care of the parents, and son will. Uh, be there but at the same time this uh, care for, for daughters will keep even this um, mother's brother or this uh, girl's uh, elder brother or younger brother keep caring and make sure that even the parents pass away and that these girls would constantly keep coming to the family so uh, within Uzbek uh, communities it's really a balanced system it's in Kyrgyz because uh, I am Kyrgyz and I know how it works. It's really uh, male biased, really male biased. And you can see it in every context. But here I could see a lot of balances. So it was not 100% uh, strong patriarchy uh, with the male bias, but really a lot of, uh, uh, in, in most of the cases, we see kind of balancing patterns that really make sure that it's, it doesn't become super patriarchal. And, 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 and this paternalism is part of this. Yeah, this no, no, uh, yeah, that makes, that makes total sense. I mean, I've spent um, some time in, in Osh and that seems consistent with um, what you hear about the general, some of the differences between Kyrgyz and, and, and Uzbek communities in, in that space. But I haven't been nearly as much as you have, and certainly not since the, um, no, I have been since the Osher events, but not in an in-depth kind of uh, kind of way. Um, so I guess, I guess I do want to ask a question about changes over time um, in this phenomenon. And I guess what prompts that is you know, I can imagine sort of going back to the idea of Ojiza and care, that one of the reasons, if you're thinking of this as an investment, right? Um, one of the reasons you invest in daughters, okay, you love them and all of that stuff, but you invest in daughters because they help to reproduce the community, right? Uh, without them, without that function, <laughs> maybe there wouldn't be as much care. Um, but with that function, of course, there's the centrality for uh, for for women. And, and this is going to be particularly important. I'm, I'm hypothesizing here, but I imagine mm -hmm. that after, you know, the events, uh, we call them the events, after the pogroms, right? After the violence mm -hmm. against, uh, against Uzbeks in, in 2010, that there might be a much more acute sense of the whole community being vulnerable. Our whole, um, our whole, um, uh, our whole sense of self and identity being under siege in this in this context, and we don't have a lot of power to protect ourselves. But one way might be to at least ensure that our community remains sizable, right? So you can. So I, again, I'm hypothesizing here, but maybe you can tell me if it sounds if it sounds wild or, or off base. But that that there might be a, a change after the Osher events, so that there's maybe greater emphasis on caring for our women, at, again, because they help to reproduce the community, right? Um, does that seem like something that's at, at, at play? And I guess more generally, I, I sort of wonder, I, you can't go back in, in time to the Soviet period, but how might this have been different during the Soviet period or different moments in historical time that you think are, you know, uh, important to think about? Mm -hmm. um, concerning this community size, I think this, uh... The, why these women are quite central in uh, among Uzbeks is mainly also with the, their function of uh, reproducing the community, and they are the heart of the community, and and it was uh, absolutely visible in all my uh, interviews. Uh, but the, with the change and what we see here after Osh event, it became even stronger. This uh, care aspect towards uh, daughters and because of this, uh, their role as uh, reproducers of the community. Uh, but before it was not that strong, mainly because uh, during the Soviet time, there was kind of support from uh, state, uh, welfare state was there, and there was support from, uh, uh, from the, uh, for the woman. 
and there was kindergarten were available women could work and so there was kind of a support but even after the collapse of the Soviet Union, we see kind of uh, the marriage uh, institution became as uh, informal safety network. And uh, they and they pay a lot of attention to this and invest a lot of time in making sure that their daughters get married well enough and they um, uh, make investment and in time and energy in making sure that good families with the uh, be matched to the to the to their daughters, because why? Not only because the girl gets married not only to husband but also to the whole uh, family in the context of uh, not only Uzbeks but also in Kyrgyz. So this is one thing, and and also during the Soviet time, I heard a lot that it was possible to get married to Kyrgyz or. There was kind of inter-ethnic marriages. It was accepted or even encouraged by the state. And uh, after all events, of course, we see we don't see this kind of pattern a lot, even though state really promoted the idea of building peace by promoting inter-ethnic marriages uh, and, and uh, saying that we would organize your wedding if you marry Kyrgyz or Uzbek with one another. And uh, there were only but not a lot of people applied for this support. And so, so I, one of the kind of hypotheses, I think I would say that uh, this marriage system became even uh, strengthened as a way to cope with the insecurity that women have. And that's why we don't see a lot of girls. The girls are not, uh, they are not encouraged to study at the higher institution, for example. What they see that after 11th grade or even 9th grade, you will get married. And this is would be your kind of future career. Um, and there are very few families who would encourage their daughters to study further. And here we also see, but of course, during the Soviet time, uh, lots of women or girls did have chance to study at higher education. No, that's that, that's super. Um, I, I imagine that if I were a sociologist, I would say I, I would love to see the, you know, if there are numbers on this, you know, changes in terms of, you know, over the years, especially since the Osher events, but maybe even slightly before it, just to get a comparison, changes in sort of number of women studying or, or maybe percentage of mm. women by ethnicity. And I don't know if this, if this Kyrgyz state actually collects that data, but also a uh, similar question about birth rates, right? I mean, you know, do you see um, increasing birth rates among Uzbek um, women after Osh? Um, and if so, I mean, you know, it's not, it's hardly, I mean, it, 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 it lends credence to the idea that, um, that there's something almost existential happening in the Uzbek community um, of Osh and, and, and Jalalabad. Um, in southern Kyrgyzstan since uh, since 2010, which would make sense to me. Um, there's a question here in the in the chat um, it, about cousin marriage, um, and basically it is it's about uh, cousin marriage in the Islamicate world. So, and this person wants to know how much do you think that the roots of this tradition can be seen as religious? So, what's the relationship between uh, religion and cousin marriage um, as an as an institution or as a preference, um, and I guess, or maybe put slightly differently, um, does does religion come up as a reason why? So one thing is to say that the tradition is religious. The other one would be to say, you know, do your the people you talk to on the ground connect it at all to religiosity, right? Mm -hmm. um. Concerning this, um, yeah, in one of the papers that I have written uh, elsewhere, it's it was like after Osh events, marriage was a strategy to cope with Osh uh, with the conflict, and they, as a result, uh, a lot of Uzbeks being afraid for the dignity of their daughters and community, they marry off their daughters as early as possible. There were a lot of marriages starting from 16 and onwards. And they could, and a lot of marriages happened in the mosque. So there were people would constantly come to the mosque by saying, are there any girls to get married? 
And so lots of uh, families would marry off their daughters, even from the mosques. And, and we see, uh, because I also wrote, wrote about the baby boom after Osh events. And uh, I checked, I went to the uh, local hospital, several hospitals too, and looked at the demographic um, book and the birth rate has increased after Osh events, uh, increased uh, slightly. Uh, and uh, this was uh, very astonishing to see the degree of uh, birth rate that was uh, increased. But apparently this kind of pattern is not unique. Uh, we see also in other books like uh, Sophie Rosh has written on Tajikistan after civil war, uh, there was also baby boom. And elsewhere, when there is a conflict or uncertainty, marriage becomes kind of an informal institution of provider security and as a result we see a kind of uh, baby boom so and concerning this um, religiosity with the islam i would treat both kyrgyz and uh, uzbeks as muslims so and uh, they didn't really specifically highlight it that the muslim or this cousin marriages are linked to islamic uh, world but rather they would uh, i uh, had questions concerning this uh, uh, the in, uh, property relations or inheritance i asked specifically whether this is uh, comes from um, islamic rules or not especially who gets the share of the of the property house or car and the uh, whether women get the property and lots of women uh, lots of parents would tell me that of course we would divide our house according to islamic rules uh, equally for all five children and this is in in the islam it has to be like daughters and uh, sons should have the same equal amount of um, property share uh, but nevertheless uh, there was also idea of uh, this um, dowry which is also kind of pre-mortem share and they would also give this additional uh, dowry upon the marriage. So there was still uh, the, the house. Some families would really uh, give the share of their property to their daughters, plus also dowry. So here I could really see when people themselves talked about that this is written in Islam, in Quran. So we have to respect our daughters and provide equal shares of property. So I. I definitely, I heard it written down the notes when my informants would really refer to Islam, Islamic rules. Got it. Um, so keep the questions coming. I have uh, a whole bunch. I mean, it feels like, it feels like we're, I'm having coffee with Oksana in, in, in Osh or something like that, mm -hmm. or probably green tea, but, um, uh, and, and having a chat, uh, but there's always so much to learn from you. I was actually thinking, I mean, your comment um, or your reference to Sophie Roche's work um, on the similar thing in the Civil War. I mean, of course, in Tajikistan, of course, war is is maybe slightly different. The duration there, I mean, depends on how long you think the Tajik Civil War, I mean, literally brings men out of proximity to, to women. And so the boom might be a, just a function of people returning from from war. Here, the pogroms were three days, right? Um, obviously, you know, in, even if you count some kind of aftermath. Uh, so that I think it's even more notable in a way that there would be a baby boom um, after the events. It really speaks not just to physical proximity, but um, that's, you know, the, the return of the return of men, but in fact, to something uh, much of greater concern uh, across the community. I think it, uh, it makes it makes good sense. I did want to ask, um, oh, so many, so many questions. Okay, so I'm, I just got back from seeing my mother. Uh, she's in the States and I'm in, I'm, I'm in Toronto and she's in, uh, you know, she's 81, she's aging and, and, and there are health issues and so on. So it was lovely to see her. I'm just sort of reminded about kinship obligations and space, right? Um, and of course, you know, North Americans are particularly mobile and, and, and that sort of thing. So, you know, maybe we're the unusual people. But nonetheless, you do have um, the possibility that kinship uh, relations and even care relationships um, might be affected by what happens over space. And I, you had that slide on um, the distance from the uh, natal 
uh, home, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know where they where where the newly married daughter would live. I think that's what the slide mm -hmm. was. Yeah. Um, so that's one one aspect. But I guess I wonder here also about things like um, like what happens culturally to these ideas. Uh, for example, with migration, are there is there a decent decent sized migration of uh, probably probably mostly men from um, Osh Jalalabad to Russia? How does that change, if at all, um, notions of care or obligation, um, um, or jiza? Um, maybe because women are, are, you know, disproportionately left behind, does that make it more or less important to to care for them? And does the care take on a different kind of a different kind of aspect because of the long distances? Um, anyway, just these sorts of thoughts came to my mind. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think it's really great. That's why during my research, a lot of people um, apparently before they get married, uh, before the families come to take the bride to their family, they usually ask whether the groom is planning to go to Russia. And usually they hide it. So they hide it by saying that he is not planning to go to Russia. But of course, after marriage, uh, things uh, change. And of course, he would go to Russia by leaving a wife behind. and uh, But nevertheless, in that context, the parents want uh, uh, their, their daughters to live si not far away from them. So that even in the absence of the husband, that they uh, these daughters can be cared by the natal families and uh, provide support. So, so we see a lot of these kind of cases in which the, the husband is in migration and uh, woman is... Uh, with the parents-in-law, nevertheless, physically not far away, especially from natal families, and and the girl would keep get support. But things get even more complicated when a girl is taken to Russia with together with the husband, and even in such um, cases, were not encouraged even natal families and uh, parents-in-law as well. So when the husband, it's even encouraged for the husband to go by themselves rather than taking the whole family. But of course, there are also cases in which um, the whole family goes to Russia or at least the couple, and then uh, the parents would constantly worry and concern. And, and there is also uh, good literature is emerging about this uh, transnational care networks through, uh, um, uh, through this uh, distance, uh, remote caring or caring in distance uh, in which the, the role of uh, WhatsApp or telephone and app become very important and, and they are kind of uh, contributing to strengthening also care network from distance, at least emotionally. Yeah, no, no, it makes, it makes sense in these technologies, uh, you know, but you know that visiting your family or being in proximity as it turns out um is is uh is different <laughs> on some levels than than being on facetime uh with them as i, as I personally just experienced but like that's uh, but of course the technologies make thinkable what in the past would not have been thinkable <laughs> the whole idea of a transnational or translocal or i can't remember how you put it um care network Hard, mm -hmm. much harder to imagine without technologies that keep people in contact and 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 keep their um, keep their um, reiterate their relationships, right, and reiterate their bonds. I think that makes that makes total sense. When, when you said uh, when you talked about the the man hiding the the, the plan to go to Russia, um, I, I I started to think a little bit about. Um, you know your first book, right? Um, mm -hmm. Where one of the one of the great things about it was how you um, documented in and again in a different context in Kyrgyzstan, northern Kyrgyzstan, um, you documented the the space for agency and the space for play, the space for uh, within clear con cultural constraints, right? Mm -hmm. so there clearly are constraints and there are patterns, and and those patterns can can be very uh, limiting to, to people's uh, space for agency. But nonetheless, even within that space, there was a lot of agency. 
Can you talk at all? I don't know if your methodology so far has allowed you to do this, but can you talk about some of the play of agency that you see within this context? Um, you know, uh, you, you mm. describe the broad the broad patterns and the expectations. I think, um, but uh, where does it? Where do people play with it? Where do people move around it, evade it, or if they if they, if they in fact do? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, great point. Uh, this I I plan to put it in the presentation but it's good that it came out. Uh, with Ojiza, a lot of uh, women play with this a lot and uh, skillfully. Um, for example, I interviewed one uh, Kelin Young Bright, and she said she was so tired of being in the mother-in-law's uh, family, and she pretended that she was sick. Uh, she pretended, and then she said, oh, uh, it's time for me to visit my family because I feel sick, and... I am kind of a vulnerable, and uh, and she called to her parents, and then the parents came and took her for like one month, even though she was not sick at all. But my claim that she was so weak and she couldn't do anything, she was uh, pretending that she was um, weak and sick, and so as a result, she had spent wonderful time with her natal families for one month, and then she came back again. So. Uh, we see a lot of uh, cases in which this uh, woman use this their weakness, uh, this idea of weakness that they need support, constant support, and uh, they pretend, and uh, they might they can also manipulate depending on the situation, their condition, and uh, use it for their own benefit. No, and I, I, I was surprised uh, myself that that this woman can do it in a good way, skillful that the parents in law wouldn't even recognize that they're playing with this. Do, do you think that she will get away with it? Or will she be, will she, I mean, so how, how often can you do that sort of thing? Um, Usually some parents, for example, some parents in law would not allow the, um, According to the tradition, they should go at least every second week to their natal family, like to see the family, relax, and then come back. But apparently, some families would not allow young brides to visit her own family for several months or year. In that in that context, this woman play when there is um, even violation of these local rules starts, then they start playing with it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, that sounds. That sound, sounds sounds like some of the things. I mean, different, very different contexts and different research question that you tackled in the first book. But it sounds sounds like how you think. Yeah. <laughs> I, I like I, you know, I I think that would be really interesting to to draw even even more. You know, so much of this is you know that we've been talking about so far is, seems to be related to the Osh events, or at least parts of the broad contours of the story seem to be related to it. Um, I wonder. I mean, is is it possible to do um, uh, you know sort of a, a similar kind of research in Uzbekistan now, and and to try to find out? Obviously, they they didn't have the Osh events; they don't have the same existential concerns in Uzbekistan, which is largely Uzbek. Um, so it's it, it, and yet culturally, they might have some of the same ideas and tropes and and basic starting points. So I wonder if if there's an opportunity to compare what, I'm, I'm not asking you to do more research, maybe somebody else should do the research in Uzbekistan, but um, from, but there are anthropologists working in Uzbekistan. I wonder if you can, um, if you're able to bounce your your findings here off of what other people have done. Uh, yes, great point uh, also, uh, because I usually present my findings to different audiences. And usually uh, scholars from Uzbekistan, uh, like Uzbek scholars, who are also anthropologists, who also look at gender aspect, they, they are great audience to me, mainly because I really want to, uh, to make sure that in Uzbekistan, this kind of cultural uh, tropes or ideas exist. And apparently, yes, it exists. And it also has the kind of a same function, uh, not strong as in, uh, for example, you know, among Uzbeks in Kyrgyzstan, but nevertheless, there is idea exists. And I, I was uh, constantly fascinated to hear such feedback from uh, my audiences who are also and be are Uzbeks and 
it uh, benefit a lot from their feedback as well. So I could uh, learn from others and other colleagues uh, based in this kind of uh, presentations. Yeah, yeah. I mean, even you, the fact that you find something similar, even if it's weaker, um, I think ACE, I mean, the, the, that suggests, of course, that there's something broadly cultural. Uh, there's, a, there's a broadly cultural starting point for, for this. But then, of course, culture is not static. You know, aspects of culture can be highlighted because of events. And I think that that's a really fascinating events here being the tragic ones in Osh. Um, uh, but I think that that's a fascinating sort of way to think about it. The other thing I imagine would come up with Uzbek colleagues, um, if not, they're right and I'm wrong, but I imagine that there's a significant difference between the big cities in Uzbekistan and how this might play itself out in the city context where I imagine it would be much, much weaker um, if it exists at all. Um, and then of course, rural areas where I imagine it's at least somewhat practiced, right? Exactly, yes. Uh, there is definitely differences in rural and urban areas. And uh, um, about this culture aspect is that um, this kind of cultural tropes or ideas become very strong, especially uh, when there is a need. So it, it, and the people use this for, for their own benefit or, or to rely on it or kind of so that others can also understand. So here we see, uh, I see this kind of importance of uh, culture uh, only when there is need and to hear people use this. Yeah, it's that not makes, like I mean, essentialist idea that I want to propose, but really about that depending on situation, they, this kind of ideas uh, become more important, but in other, in peaceful times, they would even kind of become less important and people would yeah. not rely on it. Yeah, that makes that makes total sense. I mean, that's consistent with your work on Kyrgyzstan, with some of the stuff on kinship in Kazakhstan, where, you know, like Cynthia Werner and others, you know, talking about how um, with, with the collapse of the state, well, too strong with uh, with the the weakening, dramatic weakening of state mm. programs uh, to provide welfare support after the Soviet collapse. You find people relying on their kinship um, ties as a way, as a sort of a, a kind of a an informal social safety net, but one with one with cultural resonance, right? Which helps, mm. uh, I think, to to make it much more effective among ethnic Kyrgyz and Kazakhs um, uh, more than you would see among, let's say, ethnic Slavs who may not have that extensive uh, mapping of, uh, of kinship. Um, I did wanna ask, um, I guess the eternal question that one asks you know, ethnographers, right? Which mm -hmm. is about being an insider and being an outsider, right? Um, and, and sort of methodology for doing research. So you're obviously in many ways the, the, the consummate insider. You've been working in Central Asia for you know, you're uh, or doing research in Central Asia for your whole research career. You're now in Germany, but um, you're well connected um, to your own home, uh, your own home in Kyrgyzstan. I lost your video. OK, there you are. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but, you know, no insider is perfectly an insider. Right. Um, you're an outsider, at least in two ways on this research. One is that you're you're a Kyrgyzstani who now um, has been abroad for, for a while. So I wonder how that fact might uh, play into, you know, how you conduct your research, how you interact with people on the ground. Uh, and then also, I guess, even if you weren't in Germany, you know, being Kyrgyz, all right, uh, especially in the context uh, that we're talking about, where um, there's massive amounts of distrust of, of ethnic Kyrgyz, um, you were mentioning the the how few people are taking advantage of the idea of interethnic, or you know, of of interethnic marriage. Um, and you can see why in the aftermath of an of an ethnic pogrom, uh, it seems like uh, something you maybe not might not immediately think of, and or put more practically, you're not gonna you're not likely to uh, have much contact with people of the other ethnicity except for at a distance. Um, so it's become more ethnically polarized. Maybe that's changed over the last five or seven years, but you know, for the uh, it was pretty noticeable on the ground um, in the immediate aftermath. But in terms, again, in terms of your own research um, strategies, how do you go into these spaces um, and um, gain 
at least enough trust so that the people who are answering your questions are not afraid that you're an arm of the Kyrgyz state, right? Um, and therefore somebody who some somebody who sh shouldn't be trusted. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> great, uh, great point. Um, sometimes uh, being Kyrgyz outsider helps me a lot to gain the trust of uh, people, especially in the post-conflict context, it was not easy to gain the trust of Uzbeks and and so, uh, good thing is that um, I, when I speak Kyrgyz, I have this uh, uh, northern dialect, so-called, and uh, my informants would immediately recognize when I start speaking Kyrgyz that ah, apparently you don't belong to southern Kyrgyz, uh, southern Kyrgyz community, but apparently you come from uh, uh, from northern Kyrgyzstan, and uh, you people from northern Kyr Kyrgyzstan are different. Uh, so this would be kind of a comments of my informants, Uzbek informants, when I s want to engage in dialogue with them. And for example, I would always, without thinking thoroughly, I would forget, use, I, I would use the term like Baike, the elder brother. And in Southern Kyrgyzstan, usually use the term Ake for this elder brother. So this kind of, um, this uh, small things that would people, uh, um, uh, recognize or catch and with uh, figure out that you that I was not belonging to the southern Kyrgyz uh, even to the state so and I would of course uh, really highlight my background that I work in Germany and so that I don't have any um, connection with the state and I, I will not report anything it will be really scientific work so I would explain everything in details and nevertheless uh, it takes some time to gain um, um, trust of people. And uh, I have one colleague, Uzbek colleague, he's also ethnologist, and we have been working together. Uh, and he came to Germany as a visiting scholar. And when I go there, he is also kind of um, uh, Shafkat Atahanov, his name is, and he is, um, uh, he helps me a lot to uh, introduce by introducing his uh, uh, colleagues and friends and relatives so that he helps me a lot as well. So I also have kind of a colleague and key informant in the region. Yeah, no, that's a, 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 a classic strategy and a smart one, right? Which is, which enables you to put, a, you know, perform a check on your own reasoning, um, also make make connections where where it's useful. But I mean, let's let's admit it. Um, once people are introduced to you, uh, they they probably immediately get a sense of how non-threatening uh, you are. Um, Absolutely. So I think that that's uh, that's uh, not not to be underestimated, right? In this yeah. uh, in this situation. Um, but I think it's I think it's you know really all of this is is really important it's just sort of a reminder that even within within um our own home countries there are spaces that you know where you still you know in order to study them you have to think very seriously about uh what about how you're received how you're perceived um and uh not try to deceive anybody but at the same time think about the best strategy for for um showing that you're that you are uh that the research is will bring no harm at a minimum but it may actually bring be of some kind of benefit to uh to, mm. to people, communities um so just a technical question so you you would speak kyrgyz and they answer in uzbek right yes absolutely okay okay and then no issues bes besides that sort of it identifies you as a northerner no, yes. no issues in understanding each other yeah even i did my best to speak uzbek but still they would figure out that I don't. I I don't belong to this uh, to southern Kyrgyzstan. Yeah, I studied Kazakh first before Uzbek, and and uh, <laughs> I kept going back. I mean, my Uzbek never mm -hmm. was always at best Kazakhified. That's the best <laughs> thing one could say about my Uzbek. Um, but in any case, uh, um, well, this has been wonderful. I know that you know those who have been. Um, here uh, during our conversation uh, have benefited from it and those who are able to watch it later uh, certainly will. Um, I just, I made the heroic decision, I'm not sure it's a good one, but it was heroic to get off of Twitter because mm. of all the craziness that's happening on, on Twitter. But um, we'll make sure that um, that we promote this in, in all of our networks and on social media and just to make sure that people know the exciting research that you're 
in the, in the midst of doing. And I really, um, is this going to be a book, do you think? And this will be a, one article. Okay. It feels like a book, but that's because everything you do is so rich. Um, and, and I, and I look forward to, you know, reading and actually holding in my hand. I don't like articles anymore. I never hold them in my hand. <laughs> I like books because I, at least I, at least I can I also buy. like books. <laughs> <laughs> We're old fashioned that way. Um, well, thanks so much, Oksana. It's been, it's been great to, to chat with you and, uh, and maybe next time, uh, next time you're in, you're in North America, we'll see if we can figure out a way to bring you to Toronto. Yes, I would be happy. Okay, thanks everybody. Thanks um, so and much. on behalf of the Center for European Russian Eurasian Studies, and I forgot to mention this is the Central Asia Lecture Series. I should mention mm. that. Um, thank you for for joining us today. And we'll have a we actually have another uh, event in the Central Asia Lecture Series uh, tomorrow um, on the the failure of the United States in Afghanistan, how the United States abandoned Afghanistan, uh, the mm -hmm. failure of the Doha Accords. So uh, please think about joining us uh, tomorrow as well, 10 o'clock uh, Friday. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Oksana. Thank you. Take Bye. Care. Okay, bye-bye.